never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your
Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship with La Sierra University Church. My name is Bev and I'm one of the pastors. I am thankful to belong to this community of friends from all walks of life and parts of the world. Each of you has enriched my experience of doing life with people in a faith community, and you have deepened my conversations with scripture. You have taught me of empathy in a good and the bad and the ugly, and you have taught me about joy and resilience. I welcome all who are watching online, whether you are a familiar viewer or you just hopped online out of curiosity. I believe the Spirit of God has something available in this community of believers for all of us. So however you have showed up today, welcome. This is your family. This is the body of Christ. Hi everyone. This is Joey and Kimmy and Savannah. Hi, I'm Ken. And I'm Rebecca. We're the Cortez family. I'm Rob. I'm Audrey. I'm Micaela. I'm Miriam. Hi, this is Kelly. And we love worshiping with you here this way. We're excited to worship with you today. We invite you to worship with us. Looking forward to worshiping with you. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Shabbat, Shabbat shalom. shalom. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Before we go any further, we invite you to reach out to someone via text message or on social media to say hi and invite them to join us for worship. If you're on Facebook, you can create a watch party and invite your friends to watch live with you, or you can simply share the YouTube channel or the church website with friends. our gatherings to be like this for a while. The state of California and the conference office give another update this week. We continue to operate with caution and compassion for the weakest among us. So if you have not yet seen the task force more recent update, you can find it on our website. For the last two weeks, Pastor Dave and I have had the privilege to host Vacation Bible School online experience. We wanted to share some of the highlights from VBS so you can see what the youngest kiddos of our community have been up to as we learn to trust Jesus in all parts of our life. If you have missed any of the programs, you are welcome to check them out on our YouTube channel. Enjoy this video. So great to see the life of the church still moving in each of your homes. As you see, ministry continues strong and we have this generous community to thank for your financial support. Your contributions help create sacred space where we can take scripture seriously together from the youngest in our community to the oldest and we provide help in our community. 
To give your tithes and offerings, please go to lasira.church forward slash give. spoke a word you were singing over me you've been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you've been so so kind to me Still you give yourself away Of oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God your foe, still you love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, oh. Love 
never stop, you'll never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I invite you now to join me in prayer. God, we thank you for your goodness and your steadfast love. We thank you for watching over all of us in these uncertain times, God. We think about friends and family and our community who are in need this week. We pray over the family of Ron Zane as they continue to mourn his loss and the extended community who was impacted by his life and his presence. We think of friends in our community like Kim Porter, who is recovering from surgery. We ask that you continue to be with her body. We ask for our friend Margaret Rincon as she is currently struggling with health challenges, God. We give you thanks for the relief of our international students as they can continue to plan on their education in our schools, God. And for all of the friends and families that are unnamed, God, we lift them up to you. Be with us this week, God, as we seek to live from a place of peace and abundance, trusting that this world is still yours and trusting, God, that you are still ahead of all of our lives. We hold on to the promises in scripture that you want nothing but goodness for us, God. So lead us into this moment of worship, God, that we may put down any anxieties or worries, give them to you and be available for what the spirit has for us. Thank you for this community where we are safe to worship your name, your goodness, and be community to one another. We thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Greetings to you, churches of Galatia, for myself and my companions. I'm writing to you on the authority of the one who commissioned me, not some human appointment, but a divine commission from Jesus the Messiah and risen Christ and the God who raised him from the dead. I greet you with these important words, grace and peace, words that we are familiar with and know well. We know them well because of the actions of Jesus and the sacrifice made to rescue us from our sins. Now, what I have to say may sound indelicate. I can't believe that you so easily changed how you've turned to a message that is not from or of God, a lie about God. Let me catch up those of you who might have missed this. If one of us, even an angel from heaven, came to preach something other than what we preach to you, let them be cursed. Maybe that's too harsh, but... Don't miss the point here. If anyone, regardless of reputation or credentials of, or years of learning, preaches anything to you that contradicts the gospel shared with you, then it's no longer true. It is no longer good news. And I know what I said is harsh and maybe unpopular, but I'm not trying to be popular. I'm trying to ensure that the message we gave to you is not altered by people who want you to jump through hoops to be saved. These are the people who uphold the tradition of the law of Moses and think we must do these things in order to be saved. I am no stranger to tradition either. It raised me and employed me in the earlier part of my life. I went all out persecuting God's church. I held the traditions of my ancestors stubbornly that God had to intervene and reveal to me the grace of Jesus. I now joyfully share the gospel message with Jew and non-Jew alike. 
I've traveled all over. I learned from others who were in this Christ journey long before me. And despite my past, I have still led others to Christ. Sometime after my calling, I found myself in Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus. I went to verify what had been revealed to me, and I shared what I had been preaching to non-Jews. Here is what is important and why I'm telling you the story. Titus was not born a Jew, but had turned to follow Christ without all the trappings of tradition. Titus did not need to turn to the works of tradition to be saved. God has entrusted me with a message that Peter had been preaching to the Jews. That much was verified in my time in Jerusalem. When they recognized me and my calling, they sent me and my friends on our way to preach to non-Jews and to remember the poorest of us, which I am all but eager to continue to do. I'd like to add, to disperse any rumors, that Peter and I spoke face to face about an issue he was clearly out of line on. See, Peter ate regularly with non-Jewish people, and while I was not in the room as this happened, I learned that a conservative group came through Jerusalem, and he acted as if he didn't know his non-Jewish friends. I would go as far to say that Peter was fearful of this conservative clique that clung to the old traditions. What resulted from this was other church members joining in on his hypocrisy. Which brings me to speaking with Peter. I wanted to hold him accountable to the community, so I did this in front of everyone. I said, if you, a Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being watched by other Jews, what right do you have to make other non-Jews conform to Jewish customs just to make a good impression on your old Jewish friends from Jerusalem? And, of course, there is not an advantage to those of us being born Jewish over everyone else. We aren't special. We aren't better by being rule-keeping people, but it is through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? Well, we tried it. The old rules and traditions got us far, but it will never be enough to please God. We shouldn't be convinced that we can do anything different to please God by self-improvement. We believe in Jesus as our Messiah, and by trusting in the Messiah, we do not have to try and be perfect. It isn't a surprise of how not perfect we are. And are you really ready to make the accusation that those of us in ministry should be perfect? And by us not being perfect, that must mean Christ isn't? Listen, if I was trying to be good or perfect, I would be rebuilding the same walls and systems I tore down. Here's what is actually taking place. I tried to keep the rules and it didn't work. I worked myself to the end of my rope, so I quit trying to be good. I quit trying to be perfect and focused on being God's worker. The life led by Christ showed me how to live like this. My whole identity is with him. My ego is pushed aside. I am no longer concerned with appearing righteous before you or even care about your opinion of me. I am no longer pushing to impress God with my actions. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is a life lived in faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For all of us. I will never go back on that. Is it not clear to you that we cannot go back to the old rule keeping, the constant people pleasing, the hollow message of before? I refuse to do that, to hand back the grace given by God and abandon the personal and free relationship with God. Think on this for a moment. A relationship with God is not an itemized list of rules that we must follow. If it were, Christ died for nothing. The passage from Galatians that we just heard describes the events in Antioch in a conflict that has become known as this Antioch incident. This reading reminds me of my first experience of communion at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Please notice, I didn't say my first communion, my first experience. It was probably fourth or maybe fifth week I was attending Seventh-day Adventist Church in the spring of 1991 in Odessa, Ukraine, my hometown. When I walked that day into the church, something was clearly different. People were kind of quieter. The lights seemed to be a little dimmer. I noticed in front of the worship hall, there was a big table set up covered with the white linen. I looked around. Somebody whispered in my ear, communion. It was the communion Sabbath. I didn't know what the communion was. I didn't know what the communion Sabbath was. Intrigued, a little bit scared, I walked and sat down with everyone else. 
it was clearly a different kind of worship service. It reminded me something that I was more used to seeing in Orthodox, Russian Orthodox service, more somber, more sort of uh, um, songs and, and hymns sung in a, in, in, in a very minor kind of mode. Everything, to, to say the truth, was sounding kind of depressing. Emphasis was on the blood and the suffering of Christ. <sighs> what, what's going to happen next? And then I heard this word that made me even more nervous. Nogamavenia, which is in Russian, foot washing. Everyone at the queue got up and went to a specially prepared room. Women and men separately. And everyone started taking bassinets and towels and washing each other's feet. I stood there lost. I had never done it before. I didn't even think that I could do that. And it looked <sighs> kind of uncomfortable, to say the least. So... Somebody came, touched me on the shoulder, said, do you want to do that? It's one of the friends that I made in the past few weeks. And I was so relieved that somebody offered to show me, sort of to show me the hoops. I picked up the bassinet, the towel, I washed his feet. When I put mine into his hand, it felt like an ice bucket challenge. I thought I forgot to breathe for a few seconds. Wow. It felt different. And then we went into the sanctuary, and everyone stood up, waiting to receive the bread of life in a cup of salvation. And it's quite, quite literally the bread, the little morsels of, of a baked um, wheat and olive oil, and the cup, the actual cup. The tradition of that time in 1991, Ukraine, that the people were passing a cup from one person to another, drinking from the same cup. And the deacon would wipe the edge of the cup after each person. I think that was enough sanitation at that time, different times. So when my turn would almost come, I stood there and I thought my knees would buckle. So nervous, my first communion. The first time I would be able to taste the bread of life in a cup of salvation, the body of Jesus, his blood. Goosebumps went up my back. And when I reached to take the bread, the deacon passing the symbol said, sit down. Why? Sit down. You're not baptized. No communion for you. It almost looked like that episode from Seinfeld who comes to the soup Nazi and says, no soup for you. I was puzzled. He was continuing on, and I said, sort of like, hold on, but I washed the feet. Maybe that. He didn't hear me. He moved on. I sat down. I'm not going to lie. I felt hurt. I felt excluded. I was the only one sitting with, with, with the children there who were giving me a very sympathetic look. Yeah, buddy, you're out. I understand, but why? Puzzled, I ask after the service, what's happening? Why I could not receive the communion? The way the exclusion I was explaining was the way to survive the communist regime, to separate between us and them, was the way to keep the identity of the community who struggled to keep the faith. Later, becoming a pastor, I made sure that everyone would receive the communion. I would even once was uh, given a highbrow by a mom who was holding a five-week-old baby to whom I tried to put the little piece of bread into her hands. The mom looked at me and said, Really, Pastor? She's five weeks old. I said, I just want everyone to receive the communion. <sighs> Exclusion was a way of survival. That's why I think this experience of the first century Israel kind of close to what my first experience of communion was. People were trying to develop the rules, and not just Christians, in general, the Jewish community tried to develop the rules, trying to keep their identity, keep their sanity into oppressing culture of Hellenism and the Roman 
political power. Episanders calls it covenantal nomism, which basically describes the practice. Sometimes we think that they did their, um, they followed the rules and regulations in order to earn their salvation. It was not necessarily the case. Episanders tells us that covenantal nomism meant that it's only God who saves people. But in order to be God's people, you have to follow very specific rules and not necessarily of biblical origin. origin. There was a sort, whole set of sort of halachic rules and regulations that one had to follow in order to preserve Jewish identity. You are not saved by your works, but you can only be called Jew, and God not only saves those who are circumcised, you can only be one if you follow these regulations. In fact, it got so deep into mind and a culture that to be called a sinner, not necessarily meant to create some existential sin against God. It was simply not following those rules you would consider to be a sinner. And not surprisingly, Gentiles, people who were not Jews, people who are not circumcised, they were called now sinners. And the, the word Gentile and sinner became synonymous with one another. And this, the parallel we can kind of pick up even in Psalm 9, verse 7, or in the apocryphal literature of 1 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 48. To be a Gentile is to be a sinner, to be a sinner, to be a Gentile. That was the identity struggle in Israel. The Christian church comes in the very thick of this identity search. And it's not surprising that now when Christians and first of, the, of them who were Jews tried to figure out a new twist in their mindset. What does it mean to be a God's follower? It creates a habit, it creates confusion, but it gets worse. Because now, not only the Christian message is taken to Jews, but it also is taken to Gentiles. What to do? Do we need to make people to be circumcised? Does taking the foreskin make a person closer to God or not? And there was this huge breakthrough in Jerusalem. Luke spends quite a bit of time describing it in chapter 15 of Acts. It's a breakthrough because apostles who were Jews decided that in order to be Christian, one does not have to be circumcised. It's hard for us to grab the revolutionary idea. Peter, who was there, he backs up Paul and Barnabas. In our passage today, we read Cephas, which most likely meant Paul, Peter. Peter, Barnabas, and of course Paul, now walk out of Jerusalem, hopeful. But things were not quite resolved. And the gruesome reality becomes apparent in the, this Antioch accident, incident that we heard today. Because Antioch is very different from Jerusalem. Antioch was already in the territory of Asia Minor, today's Turkey, and it was really a cosmopolitan city. There were a great number of Jews there, but predominantly Gentiles or sinners. And as Paul preached the gospel there, they realized that a lot more Gentiles coming to church than Jews. And they became to mingle, maybe because the culture of the city was such that people did not really try to separate. They were sitting at the same table. They were mingling with each other. When James found out about it, he became indignant. They're doing what? When Christianity was really in danger, James remembers very much the, uh, what happened in the fate of the James, brother of John, the other James, the apostles, and Simon, who were just a few years prior of that, were beheaded just for being Christians. To blend in with the culture, to try to stay with the flow, try to keep the rules and regulations as much as possible in order to preserve the church. That was James's goal. I can just see this first bishop of Jerusalem trying to do whatever he can to save the church. And how to do that? You follow the rules. You follow this covenant nomism that we mentioned earlier, which interestingly, 
included 229 regulations out of 341 that pertain to table fellowship and the rules of how, what, and with whom Jews, faithful Jews, should eat. Just imagine, 67% of regulations pertain to consumption of food, sitting at the table, and the identity was tied to that. Even today, the um, dietary rules are very much enforced, and, and, and uh, purity rules are very much enforced. In Israel, I was surprised. I didn't know that. I was surprised last year when I met one of my friends who now lives in Israel and told me that there are actually pig farms in Israel, but you are not supposed to allow a pig to touch the holy ground Israel. So all the pig farms have a raised floor, so pigs never actually touch the ground. Suppose as long as you don't touch the ground, it's okay. You see where these rules and regulations and how it can get a little bit twisted. So James sends his people to Antioch with a simple message. Stop doing it. Stop handing around. Stop eating together. Stop sharing the table with the Gentiles. They said stop. What I hear because of my experience of the First Communion, I hear, sit down. You're not one of us. Peter, Peter does the same. He pulls out. He is the one who was shown the message of sharing. He is the one who went to Cornelius' house. He is the one who knows better what needs to be done. He backs out. Maybe it's better. He's thinking. We can't say for sure what's going on in Peter's head, but I just wonder if he's thinking, maybe it's just better to keep things separate. It's just more peaceful. It's just politically correct. This is, not, this is not a hypocrisy. This is just a good diplomacy. We're just going to keep everybody happy. We're going to keep people in Jerusalem happy. We're going to have keep everyone happy. Barnabas. Barnabas follows Peter because he is not a superstar. He's not trying to uh, be Paul or Peter. His job, he's more sort of local church pastor who's tried to maintain this, uh, this order, who tried to grow and nurture the churches. For him, he doesn't need extra drama. Let's just do that. Let's not conflict with anybody. So, can you really, really blame James Peter, Barnabas, who are trying to do what's the best for the church, who try to blend in the Christianity in Judaism so to preserve it and to grow it with all the good intentions. The issue is here, although it's personal, personal and political, because they are humans. And it's personal for James because he wants what's the best for the church, and he wants to, quite frankly, save his life. For Peter, it's personal because he he wants to do, he wants to finish his mission to converting Jews. He doesn't want to jeopardize, he doesn't want anyone to check his Instagram account and Facebook and see something that would indicate his kind of preferential treatment or any kind of attention given to sinners, or including sinners who are Gentiles. Barnabas wants what's the best for people. But Paul takes it personally. Because for Paul, this is not just the matter of um, political preferences. It's separating people into two groups. This is where he's having a fundamental problem. We came, to, we came to America in 1996, um, and at that time in Texas, there was still smoking and non-smoking sections. When we walked in in one of the restaurants, somebody asked, smoking and non-smoking. I was surprised, and we, of course, went to a non-smoking section. Behind us, a gentleman walked in, big cowboy hat, and a huge cigar in, his, in the corner of his mouth. And he was just standing there with that. And the hostess, who is a young girl, probably automatically comes to him, looks at him and says, smoking and non-smoking. He gave her a look and says, are you kidding me? And she realized what she did, and she took him right into the smoking section. 
I was a little bit puzzled. Same restaurant, two sections, different people. And it felt like there is a wall in between. Not real wall, but the wall that separated the groups. I wondered that Paul, in that time in Antioch, realized fundamentally something that defines the gospel, the good news. Because the gospel presumes that there is only one table. One big table, there's a room for everyone. If you really think about it, in red, and I tried to go and, and raise my memory reading the Gospels again and again and again, I don't recall a single moment when Jesus turned down the meal. There was none that he would not share a meal with. Pharisee, tax collector, a man, a woman, a child. It didn't matter. In fact, Jesus was accused for hanging out and eating with the sinners, with the tax collectors. Jesus was willing to take water from a Samaritan woman. He never turned down the meal. Maybe there's a lesson in that to realize that no one can tell me where to sit or whom I should sit next to of this big table that we call gospel. The table where everyone is, in, is invited. There's so many parables in the gospels that describe precisely this kingdom of God as a big table. No one can tell me who to sit next to or who I should invite to sit next to me. Not the high priest, not the bishop, not the general conference president. This is not politics. This is gospel. And as we live the reality of the first century Israel, when the worship and the identity of Judaism is shifting from the temple to the table, we realize that Christianity comes with a bold statement. Not a human being has a power, authority to control access to the table except Jesus. And gospel becomes not an abstract practice of, of um, some sort of uh, ideas and thoughts and, 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 and philosophies, but very practical way of coming to the table with the different people, different ways of a different lifestyles, different views, different identities, different orientation, all at the same time. Different people preserving each their identity, but sharing one table. In Jewish tradition and rabbinical tradition, there is sort of a bit of a self-deprecating joke that says that there are only two categories of people, those who divide everyone in two categories, and then the rest. They, of course, consider themselves to be in the first category. Exclusion as a way of self-identity, of self-preservation. You can't really blame people. They do what they can to survive. But maybe this is the message of the gospel that comes and breaks this vicious circle that people try to draw around themselves, separating the world into us and them. The gospel gives the freedom to be with whoever is my neighbor happened to be, not someone in Jerusalem, Washington, D.C., Moscow, Bering Spring, can tell me who should be at my table. Being at one table is not politics, but the incarnational theological act. This is what it means to be the gospel, not only to talk gospel, but to be the gospel. Not surprising that the text today finishes with this well-known words by Paul. It is not longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I have a dream. If I had enough money to open a restaurant, I would call it Antioch. And there would be only one table, and there would be no cost for a meal. It's a terrible idea. But I hope maybe it will catch. Maybe it will catch in Galatia. Maybe it will catch in Odessa, Ukraine. I hope it will catch in Silver Spring, Loma Linda, La Sierra. And someone can open the same restaurant. Maybe we'll call it the chain Antioch Incident. 
And what's next? What's next we find out as we continue to read through the book of Galatians. But for now, it is becoming very clear that after Antioch, Paul will never see the gospel in any other way as a big table to which everyone is welcome. This is our gospel. Amen. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No one has power authority to decide who is at the table except Jesus. And he invites all. We invite you to join us to continue the study of the book of Galatians on Tuesday night with Dr. Rona Osborne, with Pastor Otis, and Pastor Raven. 
There's so much more to learn. If you got a little bit confused about what is a covenantal nomism or how to sort out the conflict or identity and how Jews were trying to figure out who they were while the Christianity burst into the historical scene. There's so much there to learn. And of course, Galatians need to be read through the eyes of Antioch incident because what follows in is so much more exciting and inviting us. So I hope you join us Tuesday night at 7. And now, let us join together, as it is tradition at Los Yer University Church, to sing the benediction. Be real.